I'd like to start by trying to you know, ask you about your personal journey and how it's shaped the way Google.org is currently doing philanthropy. And maybe in that, I hear you have a personal mission statement. Mm. Uh, well, my background is uh, I, I'm American. My dad was a diplomat, so we moved around a lot when I was a child. We lived in Germany when I was two to four. Um, he was specialized in the Soviet Union and relationships with the Soviet Union back in the day, and so we actually spent some time in Russia before the wall came down. Um, I think that that really influenced me in terms of having a glo being globally minded. Um, then later, I spent a year in France studying. Um, and then we moved as a family to India when my kids were eight and ten, spent a year there when I was with the Gates Foundation. So I think I've had a global mindset and then also I think a deep personal commitment to social justice and just thinking about, you know, this problem which I think a, a lot of you are wrestling with and why you're here today, which is just thinking about everything that you have been given, every, all of the tools that you have at your disposal, your business, your relationship, your network, your presence, your energy, your creativity, your resources, and then thinking about who, who am I in this grand scheme of things? How can, how can I and my company you know, come together and give the best of who we are in a singular way to have the most impact possible? So that's been kind of, I don't know if it's a personal mission statement, but it's like been the driving force in my life. That I've done that through various means. I worked in the federal government for a while. I've uh, worked for nonprofits. I worked with Bill and Melinda Gates when the Gates Foundation was a little startup. Um, I came to Google uh, uh, when Google.org was, was a startup. Um, so I've kind of seen from different vantage points how each of those entities is you know, part of the solution of, uh, of social justice. Great. And so in your current role, mm. uh, .org, how, how do you actually deploy, how do you use Google's resources on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, Google.org exists because Larry and Sergey, before the company went public, made a 1% commitment for our net profit, right? So they, they committed to that. Um, it was in the um, pre-IPO letter, <laughs> which helps, as you all know. Um, and they didn't, they didn't really know what they wanted to do or how or you know, what topics, but there was definitely a deep personal commitment to thinking about taking the company's resources. So we give north of $200 million every year now. Um, and, and, but not only our resources, but thinking about the whole company. You know, how can we use our products, our people? Uh, we're, we, we have a culture of 20% time where people can give time to work not on their day job, but something that's either good for Google or good for the world. Um, we bring teams together. We have more than 20,000 people, uh, Googlers, in the month of June volunteer and go out into our local communities and work with nonprofits, for example. So we exist because Larry and Sergey took that leadership moment early on and, and made that commitment. How we've operated as Google.org has changed a ton over the years. We follow sort of Google's mantra, launch and iterate, and we've changed a lot on our business model as we've tried to see, okay, how can we have the most impact? You know, how can we come to the table and where, where can we be differential? And for us, I think where we've really seen the greatest impact is when we invest in technology. Right. Like venture investors, I guess, except not profit venture invest investors. I mean, yeah, I think some of the some of the characteristics about how we look at, you know, if it's such a wide open question, you know, if you have all of these resources, you know, well, where do you invest? You know, where do you put that money? And for us, the kinds of characteristics that we look for in the investments we make, the partnerships that we build are very similar to, I think, the venture world in terms of we look for entrepreneurial teams, you know, nimble, uh, teams based on data and evidence, committed to outcomes and really measuring for outcomes and ability to pivot. Um, I think we don't give enough space in the nonprofit sector for nonprofit leaders to uh, pivot their um, business models based on new data and evidence coming in. Um, who can, uh, who's really thinking about scale and impact and actually shifting curves instead of incremental change. So those are kind of some of the characteristics that we look for in partners. Um, and then also, we, then we also think about, um, you know, because there's so many even that, that fit the bill there, where could Google be differential? And so for us, it's, you know, technology, who's using technology in, in new and innovative ways. Um, we think that philanthropic capital can be risk capital and that, especially as a tech company like Google, we should be willing to fund new ideas, truly innovative ideas that are going to fail. 
some of them, <laughs> and learn from that, and pivot. <laughs> so you mentioned and move forward <laughs> and not fail. <laughs> so there's a couple of pieces here that I want to dig into. Um, I want to talk about pivoting and how that can be perceived as failure. Yeah. Um, but before we get to that, I, you, you mentioned data and evidence as really important indicators of the types of things that you give to. Yeah. Um, but you also have a very human focused approach to giving and a very, and often a, a local approach. So I know um, Google has supported initiatives where you have your campuses, where yeah. you have Googlers. And so there is an, this sort of tension between, often, between the heart and one hand saying, we should give to the stuff that we feel and, and can engage with as a human, and the stuff that data supports, and the stuff that evidence would say is the best use of capital given there are people here and there are people there. Yeah. So how do you balance you know, this heart and mind? How do you balance the local and the global while sort of wearing your hat of, like, we want to do as much good as possible? Yeah. Well, those are great questions, and I, I'm sure all of you are sort of struggling or juggling that tension as well as you think about what do you personally give to, what's your company doing, you know, how do you spend your time, how do you invest your network? These are good questions for us to go back and forth on. I think in the area of data and evidence, one of the things that we need to do better as a, a funding community is to is provide the resources for that. You know, I think it's unrealistic to expect nonprofits to carry all that weight and not fund that. So we try to make sure that we're providing funding um, within our partnerships uh, that is going to help them not only to gather that data and evidence, but do the analysis, publicize the results. Um, we've also partnered with JPAL and others to just more broadly speaking support the ecosystem around measurement and evaluation and the data and evidence. And I know you work uh, on, on partnerships as well with um, people like Carrie Tuna and Dustin. Um, and I think that there's a, you know, a strong movement around that, but we have to remember to fund it and support it. Um, so I, I think that's key on the data evidence side. You know, on the heart side, it's interesting. I worked with Bill and Melinda Gates as they were shaping and launching their philanthropy. And Melinda Gates, um, it's very impressive. Her background is she was a product manager. She was an MBA computer science graduate out of Duke. So really smart, successful in the business world, then joining Bill um, in this venture. And you know, her advice was, we all need to find our 5 a.m. issue. You know, what is the thing that you wake up thinking about at 5 a.m. or 7 a.m. or, you know, <laughs> 8? Um, but that gets you out of bed in the morning because the fact of the matter is for us to do our best work, um, we need to be personally compelled and inspired and engaged in issues. So I think it's, it is important as we're thinking about of all the things we could do, you know, and of all the things we could be spending our time on, it's legitimate to ask yourself, what do I care about? What am I passionate about? What, what gets my juices flowing? Because you're, you're gonna be better at that. Because you're gonna actually read those reports that come back and you're gonna actually look into the data and you're gonna actually you know, extend and, and roll up your sleeves and spend real time on the issue if it's something that you personally care about you know, and or is affiliated, aligned in some way with the mission of your company. Got it, really good answer. Um, so could we talk just a sec about, so I, I heard you mention that it's important that we fund data and evidence collection as opposed mm -hmm. to just use data and evidence. It's a, a thing that I see as generally really under-resourced yeah. and only a very small number of, uh, of charities, startup charities nonetheless, um, actually put capital into doing that. Um, I'm assuming that you guys do in your partnership with J-PAL and others. But when the evidence comes back and it's not good, right? Um, what then? So you know, st startups often iterate based upon you know data that comes back that's yeah. not good. Yeah. Um, charities, we expect them to always be d delivering above and beyond capacity and not to ever make mistakes. Is that a realistic bar to hold um, charities to, or should we be encouraging mistakes and yeah. learning? Well, I love the culture of Founders Pledge because it's a culture around let's um, invest in data and evidence, let's fund 
um, folks who are really proving their outcomes. And I think there's also the space because this, you know, you know, this room, this, this movement is filled with entrepreneurs and people who understand um, the necessity of iterating over time, right? Google was built on launch and iterate. That sort of innovative culture is so important. I had a conversation recently. I, I was in France a couple weeks ago for Macron's Tech for Good Summit. And um, one of our partners there, Chance um, Ludovic, uh, we originally bet on them. We made a very small initial funding through one of our impact challenges in, in France. And they had a specific approach that they were going to use to help uh, in, the, in the arena of economic opportunity and, and jobs and skilling. Um, and you know it was really innovative. And you know what? It didn't really work. And uh, so they came back to us, and they were explaining, and they were working with a team of Googlers. So every time that we give funding, we also provide Googlers. Right? So we partner, we make investments, but then we also provide um, expertise from Googlers if our partners uh, find that helpful. So there was a, I think um, in this case it was a data scientist who was working with them. And you know they came back and they said, we're going to radically pivot. And I think, and so we listened to that, the model, and said, OK, you know, that makes sense. We're going to give you more money you know, so you can do this pivot. I think that kind of a relationship where we're investing in people, we're patient capital, we're allowing that room to learn and to grow and to pivot and then share those results. You know, we need to do more of that. I think as Google, we need to do more of that. As a funding ecosystem, we need to do more of that. You know, if you think about it, we're, we are partly, as funders, I think we're partly responsible for creating um, incentives uh, that are inadvertently not healthy for the ecosystem when we only fund the flashy good things that look great, you know, on the one pagers and whatnot. Um, because if you're a nonprofit leader, you spend an inordinate amount of time fundraising. And in most of that time, people just want to know, you know, what's your flashy stat, you know, what is, and, and so we need to be willing to go underneath that and to ask people, uh, you know, some, some tough questions and then engage with them as well as they're, they're uh, seeking to make the changes. You know, having conversations, we are, we're both fans of Give Directly, you know, having conversations with them about, uh, you know, making the commitment up front to have third party evaluations, RCTs when that's possible, randomized controlled trials when that works. Um, but making the commitment up front that regardless of the outcome of that evidence and that um, measurement that they're going to publish that and make that publicly available, you know, that's where we really need to go towards in this sector. Because if we're not publishing the truth about what's working and what's not, then we're just wasting resources. Yeah. We're not letting the market act. We're not, creating, right. we're not creating the market feedback that every business that's right. needs to survive or uses to survive well. Um, you mentioned a couple of things that I want to dig into, one of which is tech for good. Um, and I know it's a key focus for you at .org. Um, and I'd love to hear some of the things that you guys have been funding recently um, and why. Well, for Google, you know, I think it really makes sense that um, because we want to combine our resources and our expertise and thinking about our products and our platforms and all the way that we can play, what we've really seen is you know, technology is massively underfunded in the social impact sector. I think many, many funders are just you know, afraid of it. They don't understand it. Um, they don't have the patience for it. It it's, can be high risk. So it's an area where I think we have really seen our uh, invents, investments really um, have an, an outsized impact. And when I say technology, you know, sometimes it's, it's pretty basic level technology, you know, supporting a platform like Khan Academy. We were Sal Khan's first month, big money. Um, uh, we funded him when he was literally still working in a closet um, out of his home. Um, to, but just helped to build the basic you know, platform technology there. So not G was new tech necessarily in that case, but you know, the idea was sort of a radically um, flipped model of how to bring education to many. But then also we've seen with frontier technologies such as artificial intelligence and machine learning, you know, here's an area where we think we are uh, so optimistic about what AI and ML can do for the social good sector, but we see so little funding 
and expertise going into that. So one of the things that we did recently is to uh, publish um, a report that helped analyze all of the most um, commonly applied ML solutions right now mapped to the Sustainable Development Goals, so the UN's um, SDGs. This is all up on our Google's AI um, for Social Impact site. And to basically say, look, here, here are the ways that right now the state of the art of AI ML is being used. Here's how it's most applicable. Here are how other, some groups are using this to, to make changes in these global goals. Um, and then we did an open call, a $25 million open call globally to say, how, you know, how are you using AI ML or thinking about using ML in your world? And we funded uh, groups, for example, uh, there was a group in, out of India, Adwani, who is um, using um, machine learning to analyze the bug traps, for example, that uh, subsistence farmers uh, put out, like think of a sticky fly trap, analyzing you know, who, what are the pests that farmers are seeing locally, just taking that photo and analyzing it and saying, okay, this is the pest, this is the pesticide to use, whether or not it's serious infestation or not. But just doing that kind of work can both help the farmer increase their economic productivity, but can also reduce pesticide use in, in the developing world. So, you know, there was another one, Médecins Sans Frontières, for example, using, again, um, imagery just, you know, coming from an app on a smartphone to help analyze cultures when people go in with bacterial infection in an area where they don't have expertise, they don't have the diagnostic equipment, but just being able to say, um, to analyze uh, whether the um, pathogen, for example, has antibiotic resistance and you know what is the best uh, treatment for that person. But doing that will also will help that person individually to have the best health outcomes, but also help with this whole global growing issue of antimicrobial uh, resistance. So, so many groups thinking about using AI and ML in really clever new ways, but so little funding available for that, and then so little expertise available as which well. Is, which is funny because it's the exact opposite in the commercial sector. Mm. Like, you, you know, people say, say AI or ML, or at least they did before blockchain was the, the, the hype thing, but, and the people threw money at them to just go do anything related to it. And it's interesting to see that the nonprofit sector Con struggles in similar sorts of applications. Okay, let's um, let's shift focus now to. So I want to understand your view of the role that philanthropy has um, related to foreign aid and private markets. Mm. So there's this, um, you know, Google.org gives away two hundred million dollars a year, which is a pretty significant chunk of money. The Gates Foundation gives away a couple billion dollars per year, um, and. Uh, and development organizations, intergovernmental, give away hundreds of billions. Yeah. So can you talk to me about the interplay between the different constituents in the system? So the individual philanthropists, the foundations, the big foundations, and the, and the development agencies. I think when we think about some of the global challenges that, that are, we're struggling with as a society, you know, things like climate change, you know, education, making sure that jobs are available, good good wage jobs, growing jobs are available for everyone. These are challenges that no one sector is gonna solve by themselves. And I think we need to enter with a certain sense of humility about the role that philanthropy can play. The engines of growth and scale are always gonna be governments and markets. And so I think we, we look at where is their failures, um, where, where are their gaps, where are their unique levers or ways that uh, smaller amounts of capital with certain characteristics can come in and be disproportionately impactful. So, for example, with Give Directly, and, and they uh, sort of um, brought um, unconditional cash transfers uh, to people living in places in Kenya and Uganda, and the ability for just everyday people, you know, with their cell phone to be able to make um, small investments in, in um, people around the world who are facing tough lives and do that in a really seamless way. You take a concept like that, and, and that's really powerful, but then you say, well, and that can also then, cash can then become a benchmark too for all of foreign assistance. So when we first heard the pitch from Michael and Paul, you know, they came in and we were like, okay, this is a really interesting idea. And he was like, yeah, we think we can, you know, really uh, have millions of dollars worth of impact. and. I said, no, you need to put a B there. You, you need to be thinking about billions because what 
your biggest impact is going to be if you're able to shift the curve and change the way that development assistance is given, because that's in the hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars over time. So thinking about can we use cash as a benchmark and measure every, sing every single development um, effort that we're doing in a, out of an entity like DFID or USAID and to say, you know, some of those programs for sure are going to do better than direct cash. Like I'd say in, in childhood immunization will win every day, right, in terms of um, dollar per outcome. But let's measure every single program. And if you are running a program and you are taking a dollar on behalf of the poor, you better show that you can do better with that dollar than the poor could do themselves by just giving it to them. So we worked with Give Directly to say, let's do a partnership with USAID and where we use cash benchmarking. So the government came in and um, put in uh, a few million. We matched with a few million. We did a joint project together in Rwanda and with this basic idea of using cash as a benchmark. So I think that's an example of where philanthropy can come in, partner with the government, to help prove out ideas, help build an evidence base with the idea that then if it works and if that can change the way government does its development assistance, then you can really have outsized Ramp up impact. the engines of scale yeah. as well. Really cool. And so internally we think about units of give directly impact. So that, yeah. that's our sort of our index fund benchmark. We yeah. want to be able, we want to be doing better than give directly if at all possible and if we can't just give to them. Give to them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. So I want to shift um, now to a, a topic that we discussed briefly just ahead of coming on stage which is about diversity. And mm. I want to speak specifically about gender diversity because I know it's important to you and you've been really vocal on the topic. So I want to understand first from your perspective, uh, do you think we're making progress? On, in this space, gender diversity in tech, and second, um, how is Google leading? Yeah. What, what is Google doing? Well, I can say as a you know as a VP at Google, um, when I uh, you know first became um, part of the leadership at Google, you know you walk into a room and as a as a woman, you're definitely in the minority. You know we're we're do, we're doing better. We've um, shifted the needle over time in terms of our leadership at Google. I think we went from like 20 to 26 in the last couple of years, which is, you know, that's significant progress. We have a ways to go. And, you know, in the area of tech, I think we have a, a particular issue, right, in that um, we need to make sure that the way that we are teaching computer science, all sort of data analysis and all aspects of technology, but particularly, I think, with our engineering, you know, how how we're presenting computational thinking, data analysis, and computer science to our kids, how we're presenting that, how we're teaching that is going to really shift the pipeline, and that's going to enable us to move past the sort of 22 to 25 percent where we seem to be kind of stuck. Let me give you one example on this. So we uh, worked with Gina Davis um, Institute. If you haven't read their research and you're interested in this area, you should really um, take a look at it. So they, they, they looked at the kinds of media that we're showing our kids. So TV programming, films. And when they analyzed it and looked at characters, it's about three to one, male to female. So it's just what we're showing our kids is a very male world. And then if you say, okay, well, wh who are we showing in terms of characters who are involved in science or technology or engineering or math? What does that gender profile look like? It's like six to one. What do you think it's like in terms of what we show as engineers or computer scientists? It's really, really bad. It's like 12 to one. So you just start with what we're showing our three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five, six-year-olds. So it's no wonder then by the time they get into the classroom, if they're a kid of color or a kid from a low-income background or female, and they're like, I don't see a lot of me in these kinds of roles. So we're already influencing how receptive people are and how they perceive certain careers. So we need to think about this from root causes. And then even how we teach computer science. You know, so for example, my daughter's a, a software engineer and when she was in her first uh, intro to CS class at an <coughs> East Coast school in, in the US, she went in and, and she texted me in that first class and she was like, mom, I'm so excited. It's 40% women in my intro to CS class. I was like, that's great. And then the first three problem sets that they did were 
um, how to win at poker, you know, so you had a problem set on poker, you had a problem set on winning money in Wall Street, and there was a game, Stratego, so it's like a strategy game, how do you beat your opponent? So everything was competitive, it was about winning, it was about money, it was about card games, you know? And I think we do things like this where we inadvertently are teaching people that computer science and computational thinking is useful for one sort of specific track or one mindset. Contrast that with um, places like Carnegie Mellon or um, Berkeley, for example, where they've changed how you teach computer science. So there they teach in their intro to CS, their first problem set is, how would you use computational thinking to improve infant mortality in Kenya? They start with 40% women, and they end with 40% women in that intro to CS class. Whereas my daughter's class, half of the women dropped out. Right? And, and you can say, and some people say, well, that's because they're not as good at CS or it's just not interesting to them. Really? Or maybe it's about how you are teaching it and who is teaching it. And, you know, people, young people, millennials especially, really care about meaning. You know, they want to think about what am I learning and how is what I'm learning going to help me do what I want to do in life, which has a lot to do about meaning. And we need to show that engineering and technology and science and data can be used to help people take their careers in areas that they care about and, ha and make and have the kind of influence that they care about and that they're motivated about. So I think as we take a step back and think about diversity, I think a lot of times we focus very narrowly sort of at the end, but we have to think about the whole pipeline and what are we, what are we doing or not doing that is going to influence where we get at the end. Awesome. Awesome. Really good to hear you talk like this and think like this, and it's important important questions to pose to us um, as as sort of we employ people and thinking about sort of the inherent bias that we have and the, the decisions that we make based upon the frames that we've had growing up. Um, so I want to open it up to the audience for some questions. But before I do, one final question. So we're a pretty diverse group of people here, I'd like to think. I see, um, I think we're pretty close to 50-50 in men and women today. Um, but we're also diverse in the sense that we're at different stages of our journey. Some yeah. people have just joined. Some people have been a part of Founders Pledge for a couple of years. Some have liquidity. Some have done secondary. Some have taken a lot out. What's the one piece of advice that you would give, um, <laughs> or two pieces of advice, if we, if we want to um, go that far, that d based upon sort of your experience at, at .org? Well, I mean, let me just start by saying, good on you for being part of this movement, for being part of this community. Um, there, you know, when I when I see back in Silicon Valley how people are choosing to take. Um, their earnings and what they've been able to generate and their power and their status and their networks and their education and what they're choosing to invest it in and who can build a bigger yacht. I mean, it just, mm -hmm. right? So good on you. <laughs> good on you for asking the hard questions, thinking through this. And I, I guess my advice would be stay in community because so much of what we do as humans um, we think we're run by evidence, evidence and decision making. We are in part, but the truth is a lot of it is we're really generally run by emotion. And part of emotion is making human connections and building relationships with people who are headed in the same direction as us, have similar values. So stay in community, challenge one another, inform one another. Um, I think the things that you're going to learn from each other, the things that you're going to feed back into the philanthropic community are going to be amazing. So I'm, I'm just really honored to be here. I think that this is a great, great community, great movement, and we, we need more of you. I agree. <laughs>